it's a wonderful delight to be here and uh, listen to the fantastic talks by Professor Davison, who's just an outstanding pioneer and you know, has, has set a platform for all of us, really. And, uh, and Jim and uh, Rook, wonderful. We did a, we did a workshop in uh, San Francisco and uh, a retreat, so we're changing practices together. Um, <clears throat> so Professor Davison is correct. Uh, compassion will change you, but you've got to be a little careful because I'll tell you a story about somebody who was a little overweight, rushing around at work one day, slipped on the stairs, banged her head, and had a concussion. And in her concussion, she had a vision that she went to heaven and saw God. She said, oh, that's it, then I'm dead. And God said, no, no, you're not dead, but you do need to look after yourself. Look, there's all this compassion stuff going on around the world. Be compassion to your body, compassion to your mind and you've got 40 years. So she came around and she went and did yoga. She went on a compassion diet. She did compassion meditation. And for the last little bit, she went and had some plastic surgery. <laughs> came, out of the, came out of the hospital and sadly was knocked over by the bus. So she, she ends up in heaven and she said, God, you told me I had 40 years. And he said, oh my God, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> Compassion changes you, right? All right, so firstly, I'd like to thank many of my uh, contributors. I mean, all of us really are, all of our efforts really are based on all the hard work of others. And a couple of things is that there has been a fantastic uh, union. I think uh, Professor Davidson and the Dalai Lama setting up the Mind Life Organization has helped us. We have many thousands of years of insight into the nature of consciousness and the content of consciousness through the contemplating traditions, but we're also now beginning to move into a science. And what you heard from uh, uh, Professor Davison was the science. And what's also very important is we're all coming together to try to study the pro-social, because the pro-social is the most important. And as, uh, again, Professor Davison started off, the Dalai Lama said, why don't you study pro-social? So a little bit about me. <clears throat> My learning was in a traditional Tibetan uh, monastery up in Scotland, and there you are, you can see me up there on the left-hand side, so <laughs> And that is the meditation throne room, which is really quite amazing. So let's think about compassion then. Compassion actually is interested in the big questions, the nature of reality, and how we fit into it, and in particular, the causes of suffering. So we need to think, why do we need compassion? Well, we need compassion because life is very difficult. It's very hard. And... Uh, <clears throat> For, the, for those of you who are familiar with the, the, Tibet, the Tibetan approach, is based on bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is all about intention. So bodhicitta is all about intention, the understanding of suffering. And it's may we find a way to help all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. And into that comes building wisdom. And building wisdom also includes science. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is I'm an evolutionary psychopathologist, which means that I study psychopathology, depression, and paranoia from the point of view of how our minds have evolved. And this is the chap that we hold in reverence. And he pointed out that basically a lot of the way our minds are organized is to do with systems, motives, and emotions that serve for the functions of natural selections, the challenges of survival and reproduction, those two things, really, two challenges, have built uh, our brains for us. And we also know that the evolution of physical form, including the brain, it's, it's not great. And again, uh, both Jim and, and Professor Davidson were pointing out that actually we have some very, very serious problems with the way in which our human brain has evolved and now fits this environment. We are familiar with the fact that we have a terrible dark side. Okay, you can go to see it in Star Wars, if you would. Or you can just go and look at human history. Human history is a shocking indictment of the horrors and terrors we can create for each other. There is absolutely no question about it. We are a potentially very, very nasty species. On the other hand, again, as we know, we also have this other side to us, this potential for creating fantastic compassion, for taking a real interest in each other. We also know that there are biological reasons why, or evolutionary reasons why this can be bounded. I should be looking at that a little later on. So it's okay for you to kill your enemies, but it's not okay for you to kill your friends. So even our 
understanding of morality is very much linked to the way in which moral uh, reasoning is rooted into evolutionary function. Again, what you've heard earlier on is that we have a brain that sends us into spirals as of rumination and mind wandering. And that taps into the underlying motivational and emotional systems. So, as again was mentioned earlier, Robert Sapolsky wrote a brilliant book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and it's because they don't have this capacity to hold in mind. Now, the thing is, holding in mind means what you hold in mind plays in your body. So if you are ruminating about something you're angry about, you're going to be stimulating anger systems. If you lay in bed and you have a fantasy, say an erotic fantasy, yes, a fantastic erotic fantasy, you're going to stimulate pituitary and produce things in your head. You can, on purpose, create images and ideas in your mind that will stimulate your body, right? In fact, one of my patients said to me, he said, oh, I know what you mean, Dr. Go. He said, I much prefer a fantasy because you meet a better class of person. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole point about understanding how your mind is, and rather than letting it do its evolutionary thing, which is to be angry or anxious or whatever it is, by becoming mindful, we become aware of what your nature-built brain is up to. But what's also important, and I think Jim brought this up brilliantly well, is it must be focused on intention, the compassionate motivational system as opposed to the competitive system or the sexual system or whatever. This, this motivational system of the desire to bring compassion into the world, to address suffering and self and others has to be central. So what do we mean by compassion then? Well, compassion can be defined in many, many ways. Some people define it as a feeling state and so on. In the Buddhist traditions and the tradition I follow, it's intention, intention, motivation heartfelt wish. And so this is a slight um, variation on the Dalai Lama's definition. Compassion is a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others with a deep commitment to try to relieve it and prevent it. Now you must have the prevention. There's no, no point in just doing it today. The whole point of doing all your training is that you want to prevent future suffering. So this has two psychologies, right? The psychology that allows you to engage with suffering as opposed to turn away or dissociate, and the psychology that allows you to acquire the wisdom of learning what to do. Now, it's important. I'm a clinician, right? So from, from a clinical point of view, these two are fundamental, because this is what we work with in therapy. A couple of things, it's a little controversial, I know we have a discussion with Rick about this. Compassion is not about love, right? If you look at the definitions of love, love is an attractor emotion. You, it's associated with liking. Uh, Alan Shaw recently gave a brilliant talk in Rome showing that the patterns of the brain of love are different from compassion. In fact, when you have very strong love, you turn off frontal cortex, and as they say, love is blind, right? The most important compassion are for the people you don't love. If you can be compassionate for your enemies, if you can be compassionate for the people who frighten you, if you can be compassionate for the people who you'd rather withdraw from, then we're in business. So compassion involves courage, the courage to move over the obstacles that would make you want to pull back. If you can be compassionate to the things in yourself that you're frightened of or you're ashamed of, now we're in business. So compassion in our model is a motivation with competencies. And competencies are very important for any motivation. Any motivation you like, be it eating or uh, whatever, the animal has to be able to detect food and then know how to go about getting food. So what are the competencies that go with the first psychology and the second psychology? So the first psychology is intentionality, the preparedness to pay attention, to be sensitive. This is uh, linked to mindfulness, to be aware. And of course, when that happens, you'll have an emotional reaction to pain. So when you're sensitive to pain, you see someone in pain, you're going to react to that pain. Now that first emotion may or may not be the same emotion as the person who's experiencing pain. Then you need to be able to tolerate. Now, distress tolerance, the ability to tolerate the pain that you experience when you engage in suffering, is very, very important. And as psychotherapists in the room, you'll know that a lot of what we're doing for many of our patients is building their capacity to tolerate, okay? Because if they don't tolerate, and they try and turn off or avoid, then we have trouble. 
Empathy also is, is extremely important, but empathy is a competency. It is not a motive. It's a competency, and you can teach it. You can be empathic. The worst torture to have is an empathic one, right? You don't always use empathy for compassion. If you're going to have a marketing department <laughs> going to sell your product, I would advise you to get empathic marketers and not non-empathic ones, because non-empathic ones won't have a clue. Now, I'm going to show you a video because I think empathy is extremely interesting from a clinical point of view, and also it's multi-layered. Okay? So I'm going to show you a video, and I'd like you just to th think how you come out of here. Let's see if I can get it up here. Just notice what happens to your feelings as you watch this. Now, this is going to show you a little video. It's only 90 seconds of a chap talking about his experiences. He goes back in time, and it's, a, it's basically an advert for Bernardo's who look after um, uh, boys from difficult backgrounds. Okay, so let's look at this. Do you want tea or coffee or anything? I'm all right for the time being, thank you. Okay. You look really well. What have you been up to? Lots of rock climbing. Lots. That sounds good. So, how's life these days? Yeah, things are good. Got a job, got a girlfriend. Got a little boy. I never let him go for what I went through. Still having the nightmares though. But my own's under control. I trust people more. I'm getting a bit better now. You know, it's like I can see a way out. That one from Bernardo's, alright? We talk a lot. And I trust her. Everyone else could just do one. Women from Bernardo's doesn't give up. Keeps asking why I nick stuff. Do drugs. Hit people. I told her where to go. I told my foster parents where to go. Just like the last ones. Don't trust no one. I ain't changing. They laughed at me at the bus stop. Said I was thick. Won't say that again. Mummy's <laughs> boyfriend hates me. I tried hard, but he always finds me. I'm scared. That's the point, right? So when you're doing empathy, right, you see behind what's here. You see behind what's here. Sometimes it's also called mentalization. But, you know, people can have a simple idea of empathy. It's some kind of emotional contagion, whatever, and that's okay. But we also have to understand if you're working clinically and you want to engage compassionately, see what sits. See what sits behind the person or the patient's problem. So I like that. So. Okay, so let me find my, come back to where I am. Okay. So empathy, all of these things are really quite interesting. And the other point is that we, all of them have their blocks. Because this is about fears, blocks, and resistances. All of these subcategories, all of these subcomponents, these subcompetencies uh, have blocks to them. So what about the second psychology then? So the psych second psychology is very, very important because intentionality is not enough, right? You want to be a wonderful therapist or doctor, it's fantastic, right? Great, great. But then you're going to have to study. And if you're lazy and you don't study, you're not going to do terribly well. If I see somebody fall in the water and I think, I must save them, so I jump, and then I realize, oh, actually, I can't swim. <laughs> this, would be, this would be called unskillful. So, the skills are how do you pay attention to what is helpful to you? And again, in the second part of Richard Davidson's talk, he was giving quite a lot about second psychology. What can we do to develop our competencies for engagement? How can we reason? How do we think? What are the key feelings that can arise? Now, compassion is sometimes related to a feeling state, but as a clinician, your feeling state is dependent on context. Because if you're going to rush into a burning house to save a baby, Though your emotions are likely to be one of urgency and panic. If you're consoling somebody who's dying, you're likely to be feeling sad. If you're going to fight against injustice, you're more likely to be angry. So the, emotion, uh, the way emotions fit with motives, it depends on the context. And that's just basic how it is, right? So behavior often is, requires us to be courageous. So there we go. So many people who work to help and save others are prepared to suffer, and, and we, we very much 
value, the courage in those individuals who put their own uh, selves at risk. And there's a whole debate about the degree to which compassion does involve you losing something or putting something of yourself at risk. I'm going backwards here, sorry. Um, also, in clinically, the most important thing of compassion is the courage to engage which is causing your suffering. So for the person who's being sexually abused, we need to actually work maybe with some of those trauma memories. We need to help you begin to experience the capacity for safeness and allowing compassion. And yes, if you do this or you use drugs and you keep everybody out, that's one way which you might protect yourself, but you will always be alone. And if you're always alone, then you will always be in a state of uh, unhappiness and misery. Now again, as Brooke was saying, we, we're not self-compassion. Self-compassion is okay, but we're very much interested in the flow of compassion and the way in which individuals are compassionate to others and what they can receive compassion from others. And we have some new data now, it's not my data, it's Canadian data, that is showing that actually the ability to receive compassion, to be able to be open to the compassion of others, to, to feel connected to the compassion of others, is a much more powerful predictor of depression, anxiety, and so on, than self-compassion. And self-compassion actually comes out of the feeling that you feel socially connected. That bears very much with what um, Brooke was saying. So we know there's a whole range of inhibitors and facilitators of compassion. It's a lot easier for you to be compassionate to the people you like than if you don't. Vengeance is a big inhibitor of compassion. We were just saying yesterday at the schools program, we have a very, very serious problem in our society. We have more and more television entertainment that is based on the idea that we see bad guys doing horrible things. You know, breaking the legs of children or whatever it is they do, killing people, blah, 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 blah. Why? Because that allows the good people to come in and do bad things to them. So what's happening is a lot of our entertainments, it's all about watching these good guys do horrible things to the bad guys, but it's all okay because they were bad guys and they deserved it. That's in my view, serious, serious entertainment based upon the enjoyment of vengeance. I think it's a serious problem, uh, but it hasn't been picked up. It's some stuff that I'm planning to do some research with James Kirby, actually. So these are all inhibitors of compassion. If you don't know what you're doing, if you can't tolerate distress, if you're overwhelmed with anxiety, if you use dissociative defenses, right? These are all inhibitors of compassion. And we know that one of the ways in which we deal with some of the terrible things in the world is to use dissociation. We just turn off. We don't want to think about it. We don't really want to imagine ourselves in the position of, say, the refugees. We had a, a vote in England which was absolutely shocking. It was based upon the keeping out of the refugees. And it was, const it was, it was powered by the right wing who have hardly any compassion for anybody, apart from the bankers. So here you go then. Supposing there was a heaven, would you be happy for this person? What about that person? See, it's, we make choices all the time. So there are, in our research, we've been looking at fears, blocks, and resistances. I better just check on the time. How much time do we have? Ten minutes. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so fears, really, are things like, I would like to, but I'm frightened to. And that is because when people start to become compassionate, it actually stirs up stuff, as I'll show you in a moment. Uh, the next one is resistances. And these are people who are not frightened of it. They just don't want to do it. Uh, they don't see the point, and so on and so on. Then there's a whole range of blocks. These are people who are not frightened, nor are they resistant, but they're blocked. And Brooke talks a little bit about some of that to do with the ways in which people are working. We've done some studies with clinical staff about their compassion, and what really upsets them is they cannot be as compassionate as they would like to be. So on our acute units, which have very depressed people coming in, very poorly people, many of the nurses are so busy with bureaucracy, signing papers, uh, staff shortages, that they don't have the time to sit with the patients, and they leave the wards on their shift feeling, ah, that sense of not giving enough. Also, of course, in the Buddhist traditions, lack of insight, knowledge, ignorance, all these things can block compassion. And they're interdependent. 
what we find is that sometimes resistors actually are quite frightened underneath it all. Some interesting studies done in Berkeley showing that as we gain more resources, we don't become more compassionate, we become less. And that makes evolutionary sense. So for, if, you're, if, you're, if you're in a community where you don't have much, it, it's good to share. But if you have a lot, your strategies change to holding on to what you've got and not sharing it. So what about the metacognitions? What about people's beliefs? Well, there's quite a lot of empirical evidence now that um, clinical studies suggest that some individuals, particularly those high in self-criticism, find receiving compassion and being self-compassion very difficult. And uh, also, that these are emotions are, are, are blocked, positive emotions are blocked. So you can have negative beliefs about compassion. One of them that compassion is a weakness. It's not useful in time when times are tough. A famous uh, Brad Pitt quote in one of his movies. Compassion is great, but not when times are tough. Uh, negative beliefs about the ability to develop compassion. I'd like to, but I don't think I can do it. Now, these are some, this is a study that one of my students did some years ago. Talking to depressed patients about the nature of compassion and what they thought about developing compassion for themselves. I am my own worst cri critic, so I sit and understand things in other people, but I wouldn't necessarily accept them in myself. When I'm depressed, I just really, really don't like myself, so there's no way I'm going to be <coughs> compassionate for myself. Many of my patients have the view of, if you get close to me, you'll see the bad in me. And if I get close to you, I'll see the bad in you. So let's <coughs> stay a little bit separate, right? So you have to get, you have to work with that stuff. I know people that are very kind to themselves and they're good to themselves and they look after themselves and I think they're much better off for it. But I don't think I'm ever really going to be able to do that. When I feel depressed, it's almost impossible to be forgiving towards myself because when I feel depressed, I think it's my fault. So when you're working with people who have these difficult, painful states of mind, they feel terribly lonely, very alone, very cut off, they feel they don't deserve compassion, and they just can't see any way in which they're going to be able to develop it. <coughs> so we wanted to develop uh, some scales that would tap into um, compassion. So we had the fears of compassion for others. This had items like, you know, people will take advantage of you if you're too compassionate. If I'm too compassionate, others will become too dependent on me. I can't tolerate others' distress. <laughs> Compassion from others, what's that? I feel that if I need other people to be kind, they won't be. I worry that people are only kind because they want something for me, from me. And you can imagine children who've been abused, that's how they see it. You know, you, you're kind because you want something or you're just wanting to be nice. Or as my patients say, yeah, you're nice to me, Dr. Gilbert, because they pay you to be nice. You think I'd do this if they didn't pay me? I mean, are you crazy? <laughs> If I think someone has been caring to me, I put up a barrier. And then self-compassion. I fear that if I develop compassion for myself, I'll become somebody I don't want to be. I see it as a weakness. Uh, I will be overcome with loss and grief. Now, this is interesting, this idea. Because actually, when you do compassion-focused therapy, one of the things you run into big time, thank you so much, one of the things you run into big time is grief. It's a biggie. And patients start to feel compassion from the therapist and then the therapy and for themselves, they just engage in this enormous sadness, this deep, deep sadness about never really feeling loved, never feeling connected, always yearning to feel there would be somebody there for them. I remember one lady who had been adopted at nine months and her uh, adopted mother had used to beat her a lot. And she told me about how when she laid in the bed and crying, and her tears would make the stars and the skies twinkle, and she'd imagine these stars coming together, and it would make a chariot, and out of the stars on this chariot, her biological mother would come and rescue her. It's terrible, you know, and she was crying, I was crying, the secretary was crying, <laughs> gardener outside the room, oh my god! <laughs> There's some wonderful, actually, Buddhist texts that actually our capacity to feel sadness is key to the ability for compassion. For those of you who know the story of Chen Resni, it's the tears of Chen Resni that give rise to white and green tara, the, the female uh, bodhisattvas. 
So what is the data? Okay, the data is that. Compassion from others and compassion to others, they are all related a little bit. And what we can see here is that in the reds, we've got the patient group. <clears throat> so the fear of compassion from others is very much linked to, so if I can get this to go, they are to uh, anxiety and to depression. Really high, look how high this is here. It's the same in the students, but not quite so high. And then if we look at this in terms of anxiety for a study that was done by um, Dan Martin and his colleagues up in Stanford, this was with some um, business students in Stanford. Again, you see, whoops, whoops, where am I going here? Sorry, there we are. You see this massive, the fear of compassion from is massive, right? There's more data. Now, if you look at self-criticism, once again, the fears of compassion from others, very highly linked to being critical of yourself, feeling inadequate, hating yourself, whereas your ability to be reassuring, to look, to look to the things you can do, negatively linked here. Self-compassion, a little bit the same, a little bit the same. Slightly higher correlations there. Okay. So the other thing we were interested in is, well, you know, what about other positive emotions like happiness? Maybe it's the same with happiness. And so we looked at the fears of happiness. And here again, we found that many of our, our clients and students actually had a fear of happiness. And the fear of being happy, the fear of uh, of uh, happiness was linked to anxiety and depression. And you can also see that the fear of happiness is linked to compassion from others and self-compassion. So these two things are quite important. Um, just very briefly, one minute to go, yeah. So um, <clears throat> Jim was talking about heart rate variability. So your heart rate speeds up when you breathe in, parasympathetic, and it slows down a little bit, parasympathetic. So as he was saying, you get these interbeat intervals. So here we are, look. There we are, the intermediate there is 945 milliseconds, 897 milliseconds. And you can look at the standard deviation in these intermediate intervals. And so we did a little study. <clears throat> one minute, one minute, okay, we're on. Uh, we did a little study to look at how people respond to compassion imagery. So we had three situations. They had to just relax. Then we had them to imagine their sandwich and how wonderful that would be. Now that's a stimulating emotion, so we'd expect a sympathetic heart rate variability to go down. But then we asked them to imagine receiving compassion from an ideal compassionate person that had a kind, warm, caring attitude to them. So just imagine being with that person. And this is what we found to clear groups. So the blues are those individuals that show this reduction in heart rate variability when you ask them to make a sandwich, that's understandable, and then they go back into imagining compassion, and there their heart rate variability swaps up again. But for these poor souls, you ask them to start imagining a compassionate figure, you know, imagine receiving, oh my goodness, they respond to that with a major, as if it's a major threat. The reds are also a group that showed slightly higher cortisol, although that wasn't significant, whereas the blues, who can receive compassion, they're showing a little reduction in cortisol, whereas the reds, it doesn't happen at all. So who are the reds then? Well, it turns out that feeling inadequate, being self-critical, and having anxious attachment predicts how, you're going to how your heart rate variability responds when you're given a compassionate signal. Okay, so I think probably, yeah, one, I won't do that one. One other study, just very quickly which was the oxytocin study, which I think is really interesting. Again, we gave, self credit, we gave a group of people um, oxytocin to see how they would respond to oxytocin. And what we find is that high self-critical people, if you give them oxytocin, they actually start resisting uh, wanting to create compassion images. And uh, they also want to resist the feelings of compassion images. So I'm going to finish here by saying that... <clears throat> The, the fears and blocks of compassion are many. They operate on the, the, the motivation itself, but they can also operate on the competencies. They can operate because people become overwhelmed, they have problems with empathy, uh, they have problems in actually having, developing the courage to engage with what they need to engage with. And this slide shows that when you stimulate people who have been abused or hurt or injured, what happens is, the first thing is you open the attachment system. When you open the attachment system, what hits you is what's in there. And if there are abusive memories, that's what comes out. Now, John Bowlby, many, many years ago, the attachment theorist, wrote about this and talked about this, that you, therapists have got to be clear 
that sometimes when you first try to help people, they will bite you. Don't be put off by that. I've been threatened quite often by trying to be kind of <laughs> put to people. <laughs> what the fuck do you know, Dr. Go? What the fuck do you know? <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but don't always see behind that. Always see behind that. Behind that, there is that little boy or little girl. I'm frightened. Thank you.